On October 3, 1869, a young boy was exercised at a chapel in the orphanage where he resided. However, he wasn't your typical orphan as he had a family who loved him but could no longer care for him after they claimed he became possessed by the devil. His behaviors, including twisting his limbs in various directions and violent outbursts, was the catalyst for the family to relinquish him while he awaited exorcism. But one of the most striking things about this case is that it wasn't just one child from this family who was under spiritual attack and sent to an orphanage, it was two. This is the possession of the Burner brothers, Tebald and Joseph. Welcome to another episode of Hosting Evil. I'm Emily. And I'm Jess. And I have an episode for you, Emily, and you, the listeners, today that is so bizarre. Think about one bad brother. I'm talking about two. It's crazy. That's a nightmare as an only child. It's a nightmare as one with siblings, (laughs) too. (laughs) Well, let's hear it. It was mid-1800s, and Joseph and Anna Berner lived in a town called Ilford, which is located northeast of France. They were a poor but reputable couple, as they were revered for their intellect and strong moral compass by other members of their town. So they were penniless, but upstanding members. Yeah, so they didn't have money, but they had uh, other things. They had reputation. (laughs) The couple had five children, their eldest being their son, Theobald, who I will refer to as T because my American brain just will not be able to say that organically all the time. He was born in 1855, and the second eldest son, Joseph, named after his father, was born in 1857. There's not much information on the other burner children as this was so long ago and the records that were kept on this case were by priests in the town which were primarily focused on the brothers right. for obvious yeah. reasons. So we don't know much about the other the other kids. They were all younger though. They yeah. were, you know, these brothers were the oldest. Well, and also when you're when your two oldest are possessed, who gives a shit about the other ones? No one. The eldest brothers were considered quiet and average. There was nothing remarkable about them in either direction, whether it was good or bad. They attended their local school and were quite normal in comparison to the other kids in regards to intellect. Okay. Just very average, which is how a lot of these cases start. They're just average, run-of-the-mill folk. (laughs) (laughs) For better or for worse. Yep. So records indicated that things seemed to take a turn, however, when both boys began drawing images of demon creatures on their bedroom walls. Questionable already. (laughs) I remember there's no TV, (laughs) there's no comic books, there's no Nintendo Switch, you know, none of that. (laughs) Just started drawing these creatures that they had never, you know, seen before. Mm. They were also caught by their parents whispering to someone that no one else could see. And when questioned as to who they were talking to, they claimed it was the demons and that these demons were their friends. Oh, great. (laughs) Talk about keeping your friends close and your enemies closer. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So shortly after this started is when the brothers started going through physical ailments. It was fall of 1864 when the boys, T, age nine, and Joseph, age seven, suddenly fell ill. Mm Mm-mm. Dr. Levy was the family physician attending to the boys, and no remedy he prescribed seemed to help, and the doctor was left completely baffled. Dr. Levy consulted with a number of doctors, none of which could diagnose the unusual symptoms both brothers had. The first physical symptom that presented itself was that the boys' abdomens swelled up to a grotesque size. And they would complain that it felt like a ball was rolling around in their stomachs or that some kind of animal was running loose inside of them. Oh, shit. (laughs) And, you know, that swelling of the body. We've seen that in other cases. Yeah. Dr. Levy couldn't find any cause for this. And anything he would typically use to treat any type of, like, stomach ailment was Mm -hmm. just not working. 
Well, and he had also never seen anything quite like it, at least not in like young right. children. Yeah. Two from the same household, right. let alone. Then the boys started displaying truly odd behaviors that over time gradually turned into downright terrifying. So let's dig into all the reported behaviors that the brothers experienced because there's a lot. Okay. The brothers began standing on their heads for hours at a time. When asked why they were doing that or asked to stop, they refused to communicate at all. It was noted that their bedroom became extremely hot, even though no stove was lit and no other room in the house was that temperature. So it was later discovered that the only way they were able to cool the room down was by sprinkling holy water around okay, it. Okay, yeah, that's that's creepy. That's, <laughs> that's pretty... I mean, a hot room is bad enough, but one that you can't change without holy water <laughs> is even more questionable. That's when you know you, you're, you need to get out of there. Things escalated when their mother walked into their bedroom one night while they were laying on their backs in their beds. The boys suddenly started spinning around rapidly with force, like spinning tops. You know those old school toys mm -hmm. that you would spin the little plat. I'm like picturing like two dreidels in bed. Yeah, is what I'm right? picturing. Literally. I don't know if they were sitting up and like their knees tucked in. That's how <laughs> I was picturing it. Or they were laying flat. But either just way, spinning, just spinning. it's terrifying. Yeah. Both of them just yeah. spinning in bed. With a force that was so strong that it must have looked extremely creepy. I mean, sp yeah. Any anything that you're discussing, even without the force <laughs> behind it, is it's creepy. Still creepy, yeah. And but also very average too. <laughs> yeah. For these cases, yes. They would then go into convulsions where their limbs would contort and twist, rendering them immobile. The brothers would go rigid and stare off for hours at a time. None of their joints were able to be bent as efforts were made to get them to, you know, change positions mm -hmm. so that if they were standing, the, the adults would try to get them to sit, but nothing. They were locked in place for hours when Par this phenomenon would paralysis. occur. Yes, yeah, for yeah. sure. That rigidity that we yeah. always hear about. So oftentimes, violent vomiting would typically mark the conclusion of these fits. Because <laughs> it hasn't been bad enough. Now you got to clean up here. <laughs> yes. And this is really strange, too, because their parents noted that when the brothers would vomit, it was large quantities of yellow, foamy substance that had seaweed and foul-smelling feathers in it. And no, it wasn't coming from, like, 1800s dinner menu. We know weird, weird, weird stuff back then. No, this was just in the vomit, and they couldn't help but notice it because feathers, you know, stick you're out. You're not eating feathers, either. Like, no, that's even for 1800s, you're not eating that. No. So sometimes after what they would, you know, refer to as these fits, the boys would seem to lose all sensibility and would go dumb for days afterwards, just speaking gibberish nonsense like a baby learning how to talk. Well, Sometimes they would even go deaf for days afterward. They wouldn't respond or react to noises or people talking to them. And once, I guess when the family realized, like, are they ignoring us? Can they hear? And they started making loud noises and the boys wouldn't respond. A pistol was fired off in close range to their heads and they didn't flinch or notice it at all. So that's how they determined yeah, that they were not pretty, hearing. That's pretty definite. There came other times where the brothers would get excitable and start gesturing wildly. Their language also became filled with blasphemy, which is speaking in a profane way about God. And they started speaking in unfamiliar languages to them, such as various dialects of Spanish, Latin, English, and Italian. And it wasn't just like a word or a phrase the boys would, re would recite. They would speak at length in these languages, none of which they'd ever heard before like or exposed to. Yeah, diatribes of just... Nothing they even have the ability to say. Because there were, they noted there were other cases of supposed possession where this language phenomenon would occur, but then it turned out in retrospect that the person that was claiming to be possessed just picked up a few words or mm -hmm. phrases and would repeat that. But these brothers were speaking at length and they brought in people that were fluent in those languages to validate their accuracy so right because it wouldn't be it's not like well i've never heard spanish before but i'm just assuming that this i'm just is, gonna start saying no bueno and say, I'm, yeah. <laughs> and say i'm possessed so this speaking in 
accurate and fluent languages unknown to the person in question as being possessed is considered by the church as one of the most genuine and telling signs of demonic possession. And the majority of our cases have already had this element. I can't think of one off the top of my head that didn't. Yeah, it's pretty common. It was said, too, that their voices would change to a sound and pitch completely different than their own, like, little boy voices. Remember, they were seven and nine, Mm -hmm. but at times their voices sounded like what was described as rough, savage men. Of course. (laughs) (laughs) The brothers would also spend hours outside hurling insults and shouting obscenities that were so vile in nature it sent nearby neighbors into a state of shock and they would often run into their homes Whenever they caught sight of the boys because they were just like, what is going on? Oh, no, it's those little brats again. (laughs) Yeah, but this was like next level because they knew them. Mm -hmm. They knew that this wasn't normal. They knew the family. Right. The family was respectable but poor. But poor. The brothers would also have fits where they would go so angry that they would destroy furniture and other items in their path. And then after these fits of like violent anger – They would go limp as though they passed out but were actually still conscious but just like slumped in the air in a very visually disturbing way and just like hang there in the air. Like not levitating but just like their body awkwardly limp. Yeah, I'm I'm envisioning it and it's almost like the devil like or the demons maybe like tired themselves out and then – or maybe they had to go do some other business. And just left them there. And just left them there like when you stop playing your Barbie. (laughs) Yeah, and they're just like (laughs) there awkwardly. (laughs) So by this time, the brothers had become hostile towards priests and other religious leaders and refused to eat or touch anything that was sprinkled with holy water. So T, in particular, would refuse to go anywhere near a church. He was blindfolded and walked around town as a way to test him. And any time they brought him near a church, he would start kicking wildly like a donkey. Mm. And we've spoken before about the ability of the possessed to know things that are happening elsewhere. It's referred to as interlocutions, kind of like a psychic ability. And these brothers were no different. They would make references to things occurring nowhere near them. And when it was investigated, the the brothers turned out that it was accurate. They once told a woman present that her father was dead. She argued he was alive and healthy, but it was discovered he had passed away that day from a construction accident. Oh, my God. They also spoke of an elderly woman in town saying she had died. And upon investigation, they were also correct. But it's important to note when they would make these claims, it was Mm -hmm. followed by sadistic laughing and mocking. So it definitely had that. (laughs) <laughs> demonic tone to it. It's like your dad died and then ha, like, ha, mm, ha, yeah. Ha. Guess what I know when you don't. <laughs> yeah. The boys would oftentimes be milling about in the yard. I'm sure mom and dad at times were like, get the F out of my house. Yeah, right. So they would Stop be outside a lot. Furniture. Yep. I mean, there was just, must have been so much to clean up after these two with the vomiting and the, <laughs> the furniture. Yeah, right. Plus it's the 1860s. And what else are they going to do? But yeah. hang out outside. So they'd be outside a lot. And it was claimed by witnesses that they would watch the boys ascend large trees with speed and agility of a squirrel, only using their hands and feet. Once they were at the top of the tree, they were able to perch on a branch that typically wasn't strong enough to hold their weight, but somehow they were able to stay on it without it snapping for long periods of time. So they'd just be up there like perched. Edward Cullen from Twilight <laughs> <laughs> yeah like they would just I wonder if they were shiny <laughs> maybe that's where they got this from that right? from this case <laughs> I mean that is like super but that's superhuman ability yeah and even just the ascending up to the tree like watching that yeah I mean that's stressful <laughs> I wouldn't want to watch it I'd be like I gotta go can't watch this these poor neighbors <laughs> and, and I'm I'm gonna preface this next part by saying that in normal everyday conversations i want you to know i don't enjoy talking about vomit like at all it's not what i prefer to talk about but in these cases of possession vomit can be so intriguing and this is a prime example as to why the brother's vomiting was now escalating to like insane levels not only were they throwing up abnormal amounts of foamy substance with feathers they were now throwing up small household items that weren't available to them and that didn't look familiar to the parents as being something that belonged in their home 
Okay, this does remind me of the possession at Loudon with the the nuns that were puking up. Remember, they claim like they puked up the pack from the devil. Yes. So I mean, hey, I guess I guess it's a thing. It's a especially well, back then it was. <laughs> it does make you wonder, like, what 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 does the devil get out of this? <laughs> and I guess he, the shock value, the shock value, but also like, is he secretly fucking with someone else in town? <laughs> like, where's my wooden you, screw? Right. <laughs> oh, it's in Joseph <laughs> coming out in his vomit. I don't even know, but I do think that like, it adds an element of like, what if insane shock to the people watching this? But like, what if every time you lose something and you never find it again, it's, it's actually being vomited it's, by someone else? It was vomited by someone else. <laughs> We should start um, marking our stuff with a little <laughs> Sharpie marker. If anyone you ever, never know. If anyone ever vomits anything with the initials <laughs> E-E-W, that's mine. I'll it's have it back. It's not really a portal things are going through. It's our stomachs. Please contact me for my email address. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so it wasn't like also like they were saying that these items that these boys were vomiting the parents were like no this didn't come from our house but it wasn't like they were getting social invites from their friends at this time so where did this stuff they're not going anywhere where are they finding it even if they were just to puke it up and they didn't note what it was i'm picturing 1800s spoon wooden screws things of that nature they said yeah. general household items not like they decorated their homes with a ton of knick-knack nonsense that we did i have no idea but if you're if you're puking up literally anything that's anything like... other than puke there's something <laughs> wrong <not> yeah <laughs> okay so it was also noted in the records that the boys became intensely flexible something they weren't before all this started so they were able to bend themselves completely in half backwards and forwards causing quite the sight to those who witnessed it. It's not just like they were doing regular bridge ups. They were like completely bent in half 180. This is more than just uh, cheer. Gymnastics 101. (laughs) Cheer and gymnastics 101. Yeah. And so remember the brothers were small. I mean, seven and nine, Mm -hmm. but they were said to have the strength of grown men and would go into violent fits at holy sacraments, particularly the blessed medal of St. Benedict and pictures of Our Lady of Perpetual Succor. The yells that would come from the boys was so inhuman and awful that it drove people away from the home that were near. It just was so guttural and animalistic and loud. Yeah. You're dealing with, one possessed person, this stuff can be scary, let alone two. Two. Right. At night, things would get really weird. Oh, <sighs> shit. I thought, I guess I just assumed this was only no, at night. Oh, this no, this was during the oh, day. Fuck. This is a real living nightmare. <laughs> the boys would rapidly turn over from their backs to their stomachs, staying completely completely rigid with their arms to their side while in bed over and over and over again just in rapid succession oh my god and the parents said that the speed at which they did this was so alarming it was as if not just one but several unseen forces were controlling their movements yeah that's pretty bad this turning would occur nightly but then it was later replaced by something even more disturbing to witness The boys would intertwine their legs and arms, knotting themselves together. Ooh. Uh Uh-huh. Those who witnessed this said it was as if the boys' arms and legs were made of rubber. Adults would try to, like, detangle them, too. This is so creepy. Can you picture that? No, I can't. Kids are so fucking weird. That's what I'm saying. (laughs) Kids are creepy anyway, Anyway. let alone when they're knotting themselves together. (laughs) Oh, my God. Oh, no. And no, like, amount of physical strength by adults could unlock them. Of course, yeah. But get this. They would do this every two to three hours for days on end. Holy shit. That is, like, I can't even picture what that must have looked like. So they're not at the orphanage yet? <laughs> not yet. <laughs> but you can see maybe how they got there. <laughs> yeah, right? Okay, so in some possession cases, we hear about levitation, 
which is the action of rising or causing something to rise and hover in the air by means of supposed magical powers. It is believed, though, that in cases of possession, the demons are the ones influencing the person possessed or objects around them. I don't know. It's like a flex or something. Yeah, right. They're like, look what I can do. For me personally, whenever levitation comes into a case, it's the end all be all boxes to check for me. Okay. Like if there's levitation, I'm sold. You're possessed by the devil. No other explanation. I don't know. I can't come up with one. I, unless you're, yeah, because what's. Unless what's you're David that, Blaine. Well, I was going to say, what's that game? Feather, light as a feather, feather stiff, stiff as, as a board. board. So unless you're playing that game. Or you're David Blaine. Or you're David Blaine. You're possessed. That's the only other explanation. <laughs> so the brothers had this phenomenon occur also and would often levitate, sometimes taking the furniture they were sitting on with them in addition to causing other objects in the room to fly around. Oh, shit. Yeah, and then again, this is just one, this is two. two. So, like, we're doubling everything we see here. So their parents noted that the drapes would suddenly close and the actual window itself would open and shut on their own, too, when the boys would be levitating, along with, you know, the tea kettle and the vase. Yeah, so they're, like, destroying the house. <laughs> and also just making it so creepy. Yeah. I mean, this is what horror movies put in scenes to visually creep people out. Right. Is what's happening at and this they house. And they are just witnessing it for shit and giggles firsthand every day all day so at this point i was thinking to myself has anything announced itself yet in terms of like what demon yeah, is present like any, you know any like what is going on what do we got so t was the only one of the two who claimed to see a creature okay he described it as being covered in feathers with a bill like a duck and human hands that ended in terrible claws when he saw it, he would frantically fight it and would cry and scream, saying it was trying to strangle him. This would happen upwards of 20 to 30 times a day for this kid. What? But interestingly enough, his brother Joseph, Zip Nada, totally didn't see anything. Fine. I mean, he was experiencing all this stuff, but never saw this never creature saw and was never, the... like, traumatized yeah. by it. The I gotta, I've never thought that i would say this but maybe feathers can be creepy well and going back to the earlier <laughs> vomiting days he was feathers? throwing up feathers oh, that ugh. were foul smelling well of course i mean i, I mean i don't know how feathers it would smell. be weird if they smelled like roses when he puked on mm -hmm. we would be telling a different story but they noted that like extracting them from the vomit they themselves carried their own scent. Ew. And if you're now connecting it to whatever this creature was, right. you can kind of see why it would smell like 10 times worse. So when the creature would make itself known to T, those in the immediate vicinity noted that an awful foul smell would fill the room. Okay. And saturate his clothing. Oh, shit. So the family would smell his clothing, try to wash it, Nothing happened, so they had to burn his clothes to get rid of the smell. They must have really been dead in debt at this point. I mean, they were already penniless, right? And they're like right. going through clothes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just like really <laughs> psychological warfare, like on yeah, all levels. Right. Okay, so if you think that's crazy, when they would remove both boys' clothes, because sometimes Joseph's clothes would smell too. Yeah. They would find strange aquatic grass typically found in bodies of water in their clothing as well as various strange feathers. I'm very intrigued by this water-dwelling creature. Feathered creature, yeah. I've never heard like I've never heard of anything. Me neither. And also, I mean, seaweed in northern north what, northeastern mm -hmm. France. Yeah. Like... And they weren't near water where this occurred. That's why everyone was perplexed like yeah so they would take off the clothes all this would be within the boys somewhere but no one could explain how they got there okay and then here's the even truly creepy part of it mom would scrub both of the boys down put on fresh clean clothes and shortly after they were covered again in the aquatic grass and feathers oh even though they God. didn't go anywhere yeah. they didn't even leave the house and they weren't regularly bathing back then so i'm sure that every time that she had to do that she was it was a task yeah isn't they're, that crazy? They were probably the cleanest, cleanest boys in 1864. <laughs> Aside from the seaweed and feathers well, yeah. <laughs> strewn around. For the two seconds that they were clean. 
So one day, a Corpus Christi procession went through the town and passed by the burner home. So this is when like church members would march through town as it marked a walking with the Lord and affirming like of their faith. Mm -hmm. The brothers were in bed in deep sleep and didn't know that this procession was happening. One of the priests in the procession was holding a blessed sacrament, and as it passed the house, the brothers shot up out of bed, and their subsequent behaviors turned what witnesses stated as indescribable, including fits of profanity and shouting vile obscenities. So the brothers distorted their limbs into thousands of unnatural and inhuman poses with their eyes bulging so wide it was as if their eyes started at the top of their forehead. Oh, my God. So as their eyes are bulging wide, all their limbs just immediately start distorting in different directions. And then they crawled off their bed like a spider and went into the two corners of the room. Oh, God. They sat in the those corners moaning and retching in agony, sounding as if they were dying as the procession passed outside their home. Okay, shit. So the Blessed Sacrament's coming in, doing God's good will, and those demons are like, son of a bitch. Yeah, they were just like <laughs> not having any of it. And this poor They're like, procession... You couldn't, have given us a, you couldn't have given us a heads up. <laughs> the p- procession, the people that were in it, heard this like monstrous screaming yeah. coming from the house and they were all shaking with fear and terror they didn't know what was going on so charles bray the parish priest of the town got wind of this and decided it must be diabolical in nature and had to be possession since no other explanation could be made i would agree <laughs> no duh Charles Bray sent Monsignor Andreas Rass a full account of these terrifying events that he collected, but the bishop wasn't so quick to come to the same conclusion as he felt there must be some natural explanation for these symptoms. So an investigation commenced. Again, the church taking their good old time with everything. They lo- Listen, they love to make you check every goddamn box. They really do. And then you got to write your name and the date underneath. Terrible. So in the meantime, the boys' parents made the tough decision to send them away during the investigation so they were relinquished to the St. Charles Orphanage. I mean, with three other kids and these awful symptoms and behaviors, the family felt that they could no longer properly care for the boys. Can I just say, for me, that would be the not-so-tough decision. (laughs) (laughs) You'd be like, get out. I'd be like, okay, kids. You're no longer wanted. You can go. Scram. I do not judge them at all. And for anyone who thinks otherwise, like, come talk to me when, like, two out of your five kids are, like, splitting their limbs in different directions and vomiting feathers. Like, Right. Yeah. It was a nightmare for this family. And they had other kids to... That were witnessing this. Of, right. I, mean, I mean, how how are those kids sleeping at night? Not well. Not well, <laughs> I'm <bitch>. sure. <laughs> I mean, was anyone sleeping in that house? No. The <sighs> devils, maybe. I don't know. Oh, my God. So while at the orphanage, the boys would announce to the nuns caring for them that they were, quote, the lords of darkness. Oh, okay. That's, that's I'm sure the nuns loved that. Loved that. that. <laughs> And they continued with having these wild behaviors. So it would be four agonizing years. Oh, my God. Before an exorcism was finally approved. Stop. Four. Four? Four years. I might have just killed Carly's ears, but four? Yeah. When I say the church taking their good old time, I mean they're- Four fucking years? I mean, Emma took what, like 20? That's true. (laughs) Yeah. But these were like kids. You think there would have been some sense of, I don't know, urgency. urgency. <laughs> but no, the church was like, send them to Sunday school, send them to an overdose, they'll be fine. No, they were not fine. And they had four years of torment. Not only they themselves, but for those caring for them who had to go through now. this. Like this was this was like constant torture by default to anyone that was caring for these these kids. Those nuns should have written an angry letter. <laughs> I'm sure they did. Maybe that's why it was only four years and not 20. (laughs) (laughs) Or maybe that's why it was four years and not two. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) So Father Salquat was commissioned by the bishop to perform the exorcism. It was decided that T's exorcism would take place first, most likely because he was the one seeing the demon creature. And T's at like 15 at this point? So he's 14. 14. Okay. 
So at two o'clock on Sunday afternoon, October 3rd, 1869, 14 year old T was forced to enter the chapel of St. Charles, a place he had previously avoided at all cost. And they didn't just like have him enter it. Like this kid hid. He knew it was coming. Right. They had to go freaking find him because yeah. he was just going to not make himself known. So they they got him in, and he was so enraged that they had to get strong men who worked on the grounds, including the gardener, to be brought in to help restrain him. They brought him in and stood him on a carpet that was in front of the communion rails. By this point, he was writhing in agony. His face had turned a deep shade of red, and his eyes were completely sealed shut. He didn't want to see anything in the in the chapel. Oh, shit. Those around him noticed that a thick yellow froth started to ooze from his mouth and then started pouring out in large amounts onto the floor. That's worse than room when I have a hangover. Ten times worse. (laughs) (laughs) The exorcism began with the words, Santa Maria, pray for us, but in Latin, Mm -hmm. which in response, T let out a hideous sound from his throat. Things continued, and T was said to act like a wolf attempting to bite at the priest's hands and would howl. They exhausted all their efforts that day and decided that they would have to continue the next day, which is pretty common. Exorcisms usually don't just start and end like in one day. And no, it's not a it's not a one day John. You know, it's not like it's not like when you go to get your car's oil change. You're not going to hang out in the Jiffy Lube while the exorcism is completed. <laughs> no, it's a process. The next morning, T was placed in a straitjacket this time, then tied to a chair. As the exorcism began, guttural roars came from him, and then in front of everyone, the chair, along with T, levitated upwards. It was a struggle to get him and the chair back down as men were thrown by an unseen force to the ground any time they attempted to get near him. Wow. So he hovered up there for a long period of time. Finally, they were able to put the chair back on the ground just as those large quantities of yellow foam began pouring from his mouth. Through the straight jacket, they could see his limbs starting to twist and contort underneath of it. So even tied. Yeah, of course. Even tied. Even with all the attempts that you're going to do, the devil, the demons will still Still flexing. (laughs) Yeah, they're still flexing. The priest stayed on course and held a crucifix in front of T and said, unclean spirit, disappear before the face of immaculate conception. She commands, thou must obey, thou must depart. As everyone prayed, a disgusting stench filled the air as T's limbs convulsed in one sharp movement before he passed out. Wow. This all happened over the course of two hours, and by the end, T awoke confused as to where he was. It appeared that the demons had left. So that was the end of what was his exorcism. I mean, it took two days. Yeah. I mean, well, two days, though, is not It's not a lot. I mean, there's been months and months of other exorcisms we've seen. Well, yeah, and even considering four plus months of his suffering. Yeah, he had to endure a lot. So that's when they marked the end of his exorcism, and he was dubbed as being free of the demons. So now to Joseph, who by this point had grown steadily worse, and the demon had by this time announced itself as being ten times stronger than the one in his brother. Oh, shit. And he was even the one that wasn't... The one seeing anything. Yeah, he was in the least worst case. (laughs) Well, and you'll see, I think he still was too. Okay. On October 27th, the same year, so just a few weeks later, a 12-year-old Joseph was taken early morning to the chapel where a few religious men, his parents, and half a dozen others were present. Even though the demon said it was stronger, it only took one man to restrain Joseph. And he growled and barked like a dog. But other than that, he was pretty calm for the most part, right. especially in comparison to his brother. I think the demons were just trying to be like, they were weak. Hey. <laughs> yeah, they were like weakened. Just but trying like, to like talk game. All bark, no bite. <laughs> sure. During the exorcism, the demons were requesting that they be cast into animals such as herds of swine or sheep. And usually when that happens, they want to be cast into someone else, like another human. Yes, but Jesus did cast a demon into a herd of swine. Jesus is allowed, but I don't know if the demons are allowed to be asked to do well, that. Well, yeah, I mean... That's weird. Like, if I was a demon, I would rather be in a person than a sheep. No, because maybe in a sheep, you're like... 
unsuspecting you know you're just <laughs> you're out there in the countryside living your best demon life you're eating not eating grass yeah eating grass you're not well maybe finding some seaweed and some <laughs> feathers i don't know but and maybe because it's an animalistic demon too i think i'd still rather be well, a human sure yeah. Okay. <laughs> your okay. argument was not strong enough for me emily i okay, don't want to eat demon grass Jessica. i want to eat chicken and whatever else humans eat demon emily would happily become a pig <laughs> have fun with that i'm already there but so so the demons are requesting like please don't put us in another person we're done with these humans put us in some swine or some sheep maybe there's they were like, this is four years too long. We've been trying to get out of here. We don't want to be in these children anymore. <laughs> children Just can like do that. Weird. Did you know <laughs> kids are weird? Children have that effect on people. And demons are not excluded. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the priest was, yeah, you're right. going back to hell. Okay. Like, he was refusing this I request. This priest. Thank you for that. Yeah. Because okay. most people would be like, oh, well, if we put him in swine they won't go into someone else. But this priest was like, you're going back to no. hell. As Ed and Lorraine Warren would say, the only place for a devil is not here. <laughs> no. And we've seen in other cases too, where the demons actually say when they're weakening, like, I'm scared. Don't, don't, I don't want to go back to hell. Yeah. They're, they're, they don't want to be there. They're playing games. Yeah. So after a deep roar from Joseph, he fell into a sleep and upon awakening, he too was overcome with, not knowing where he was. It was a strange location, just as his brother did. So mm -hmm. it seemed like they just were not cognizant of anything that happened leading up to that day. Whoa. The, so the happy ending here <laughs> is that both boys, the exorcism was... Successful. Yeah. I mean, both that... I mean, Joseph, it only took the one day. T, it took the two days. And they were able to go home. Okay. After that. So the orphanage was just like a pit stop. <laughs> Four years. It's a long pit stop. But So 14 and 12, they left when they were seven and nine. But now they were able to go back home and reunite with their family back to the happy preteens. I mean, is that even a thing? But they were happy yeah. enough going back home to their family. Low key, though, those parents were smart because they kicked them out until they were a little bit more grown and then they could come back and be responsible. <laughs> yeah, right. right? <laughs> um, they went back to school. Okay. But the funny thing is, too, they had zero memory of anything that happened in the last four years. It totally wasn't just the sense. exorcism. No, it, totally makes sense. it was the whole time period that they were considered to be possessed. Yeah. And neither boy had any further issues with possession from that point on but sadly it all must have taken a toll on them physically in ways we probably can't even imagine so t's exorcism happened when he was 14 he died at the age of 18 just four years after his exorcism and joseph who was 12 at the age of his exorcism died at the age of 25 just 13 years after his no theory was ever documented as to explain how the boys became possessed in the first place. Like, there was just the end. Now we got to go do some research to figure out what demon that was. The demon never announced itself yeah. by name. And so I'm thinking like, okay, so when you talk about possession, the, the working theory is that you either have to invite it, whether or knowingly or unknowingly through like a mm -hmm. Ouija board, or it has to be put upon you by way of a curse. Yeah. I'm not saying I believe in curses. I don't freaking know. What, what the hell do I know? But what I do know is 1800s northeast France, a little town. I don't know. I, I'm thinking that is probably the most logical explanation. The boys weren't playing with a Ouija board. The, the family, family was well, religious. Yeah, there was no Ouija board. There was I mean, none of that. Maybe, and maybe there was a curse put on the family because maybe someone decided, well, you know what? They're poor, but they still have their well-to-do nature. So we're we're going to find a way to take Maybe they gave someone bad advice. I don't know. Who the heck knows? But I'm thinking that's probably how this family, out of the blue one day, found themselves in this. Or their little bullies. Who knows what they were getting into in the woods of northeastern France. Or maybe, like, another – like, 
Yeah. Kids, kids get into some stuff. Yeah. But again, they, they didn't have access to a lot of, you know, kids have everything at their fingertips now. Now? No. They didn't have that back then. So I don't know. The jury's still out. No one really knows how this family, but obviously it, it impacted them because they didn't live very long. I mean, right. they lived happy lives after, which is the silver lining here. Well, and it's all recorded. So clearly someone was believing it. I don't know, dude. That sounds like two badass kids. <laughs> <laughs> but they were so good before and so good after. It's just crazy to think that, like, yeah. I mean, that's probably one of the weirdest ones. The stuff that they did and the fact that they were kids. Yeah, right. Kids are so creepy. Kids are really creepy. Well, you want to hear the really weird thing? My children's age is them, the time they were possessed, 12 and 14. And so I was writing this. They'd come in and talk to me. I'm like, please stop looking at me stop looking at me <laughs> I'm like why are you looking at me like that They're like I'm hungry can I have a snack I'm like just leave me alone <laughs> take whatever you want just go just, just, just go <laughs> you're like throwing your wallet at your kid you're like, just like what is wrong with her mom's crazy like you don't understand oh my god yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for joining us on this episode of Hosting Evil. For more information on this case and others, you can visit our website at hostingevilpodcast.com. And don't forget to check us out on social media at Hosting Evil Podcast. Until next time, I'm Jess. Peace, love, and light. And I'm Emily. Keep fighting those demons. Hosting Evil is recorded and produced by Carly Strange at Rockdale Studios.